uh, start off with them. So I'm getting started now that uh, uh, all the panelists have joined. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's great uh, privilege to have all of you join today. Uh, on behalf of FIKI, I welcome the panelists to this webinar. And uh, we'd like to focus today on a question that many of us in business are asking, that during these uh, unprecedented times, you know, what would be the legal ramifications of our business? You know, if there's a contract between a buyer and a seller that is frustrated because we cannot supply, will force major, a concept we've heard about, but you know, we don't exactly know how it applies because these are times that are different from the ones we've lived in before. Will that apply? Uh, what if it is not part of the contract, but it is an act which is, you know, in a superior force is something that we couldn't uh, accomplish. Uh, what will happen to a supply chain if we are not getting source material, if our goods are not being moved from one place to another? What will happen to construction industry? Uh, what will happen in terms of wages and employees? For the, to answer these questions, we have a phenomenal panel today, uh, starting with Mr. N.G. Khaitan of Khaitan & Company, senior partner. You probably all have worked with him or uh, uh, you know, got his advice. So he would go first, uh, followed by Shoujo Mundal of uh, Fox & Mundal, partner of Fox & Mundal. long-term and short-term contracts and cross-border contracts. So we greatly look forward to all the three speakers. Before, Because we are already delayed, I don't want to uh, waste any more time. Can we start with Mr. N.G. Khaitan? Sir, if you can you know, start off talking about what yeah. is force major and then take us through. And then directly yeah. we'll uh, move to the other speakers. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Rudro. I think uh, this is the hottest topic as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned. And I actually don't remember how many webinars I have done on this. Practically, I've been doing on this subject every day apart from other subjects. Uh, actually, this is for the first time that uh, this particular provision, post major and frustration of contract, has got a prominence. And this prominence has happened because of the lockdown, which was declared under the, uh, <coughs> under the Disaster Management Act. And uh, Disaster Management Act is a provision that it supersedes all other acts, that is Section 72 of the Disaster Management Act. And it also says, uh, Section 62, that uh, any order passed under the Disaster Management Act is binding on the state law. So therefore, this lockdown actually started with the not under the Disaster Management Act, it started under the Epidemic, the Epidemic Disease Act, which is a very old act of 1897 and which has only four states. So if you will recall that initially, a number of states declared a lockdown under the Epidemic Disease Act, and thereafter the central government came out with a lockdown under the Disaster Management Act. Now, the question here is that, uh, what is force measure and what's the frustration of contract? What would happen to during this lockdown period, what would happen to the contracts, uh, whether they would fall within the category of frustration of contract or whether they would fall within the category of force measure. Now, let me tell you that there is no statutory law of force measure in India. Force measure is basically a civil law and it basically we incorporate force measure in contracts. It's a bi bilateral understanding between the parties and they include force measure clause in, in contract. Uh, uh, unilaterally, no force measure clause can be put into the contract. And if there is a force measure clause in the contract, then the provisions of the prescription of contract do not apply. Now, this force measure clause is basically that uh, in the event of war, disaster, earth, plague, you know, uh, epidemic, calamity, uh, these provisions are normally put in the force measure clause. And normally, almost all the force measure clause there is a suspension of contract during the period of force measure. Suppose there is a strike, then there is a suspension of contract in relation to its performance. So let me tell one thing very clearly, which is of great importance, that in force measure, the performance is excused for a limited period of time, but the payment under the force measure is never excused. So this is very important, that the performance is 
excused, but the payment under the force major is not excused. Whereas the frustration of contract, there is a statutory provision under the Indian law, which is section 56 of the uh, Contract Act, which, and also section 32 of the Contract Act, which deals with contingent contract. And uh, frustration of contract applies in relation to where the performance of the contract becomes impossible to perform or, or it is unlawful to perform. Now, I will, since we have three speakers and I will be more interested in a question and suggestion, let me, let me tell you that number of issues have arisen particularly in relation to the payment of rent, in relation to the payment of wages, uh, what would be the, if there is a landlord and tenant, whether the rent will get suspended during the lockdown, whether you are bound to pay, uh, make payment of wages. These are number of questions which arise. Apart from other, whether how do you perform your contract, whether your contract stands terminated, or whether your contract, your contract is suspended for the time being. Now, these issues are there. Let me tell you what the courts in India for the time being have held. Now, I'll give you a very simple illustration. Uh, there was a ship going uh, to America from, and it was going to switch can, switch canal. Now, the switch canal was stopped for the time being. So the ship had to turn back and had to take another route. Now the, the, that route was a route to Cape of Good Hope. Uh, Good Hope. So it was a very longer route and it would have taken a number of doors and days and your cost would have increased the freight charges. So therefore the principles of frustration of contract was invoked and the, and the court group were held that there is no frustration of contract because the alternative route is available. So therefore in relation to if there is a if there is a change in law and in relation to this change in law there is a there is a cost increase of cost there is an increase of cost then there would be no frustration of contract now lately there was a, a case between Tatas and Adanis where they, where they were to uh, give power uh, Adanis were to give power to Tatas and they were they were importing coal from Indonesia now the Indonesian coal was suspended for the time being. And the Tata to the uh, 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 point, Adanis to the point of the frustration of contract because sourcing coal from another country would have been very expensive. The court said no, uh, you cannot enforce frustration of contract because you can, uh, 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 you can obtain coal from other sources. So therefore the principle is that economic hardship increase in cost. If there is an economic hardship, if there is an increase in cost, you cannot import frustration of contract, nor can you impose the provisions of force measure. So if the same analogy is applied, uh, therefore in relation to a tenancy or in relation to a lease, if there is a if there is a lockdown, then this lockdown is for a temporary period. If this lockdown is for a temporary period, then there would be no force measure in the sense that your payment, you are bound to pay the pay, you are bound to make the payment as I said, that in force measure, the performance is suspected for the time being but the payment has to be made. So therefore, if you invoke the principles of force major, the force major principles will not be applicable because your payment has to be made because you are in possession of the property. You may not be able to use the property, but you are in possession of the property. A simple illustration I give you, the illustration is suppose there is a strike. Forget about the force major, forget about the lockdown, and there is a strike uh, in your factory or in your offices, and you are not able to use the premises. The provisions of that you will cannot say that I will not take the payment of rent because the property is in your position. You are unable to use it because of the strike. But there is no fault of landlord in relation to non-user of property by your rent. So therefore, as far as the similarly in relation to the payment of measures, uh, my view has been very clear that a directive issued by the central government, a directive issued by the central government is binding on is binding on all. And this directive, which was in relation to the payment of wages, the payment of wages act in India. In fact, there is a very big cover on Telegraph, which covered my view and the views of other lawyers. In fact, Dr. Abhishek Mani Singhvi also addressed a pity meeting, where also he took it to, uh, his view was that the payment of wages have to be made. But this issue is now before the Supreme Court. In fact, the matter was heard today before the Supreme Court. No order has yet been passed, and two weeks' time has been given where the Supreme Court will decide whether the, whether the order passed by the Central Government and the Epidemic Disease Act for directing for payment of wages of what view the Supreme Court takes. But as on date, our view is that the payment of wages has to be made because this is an order passed under the Epidemic Disease Act and this supersedes all other laws. So therefore, it supersedes the, 
provisions of the Industrial Dispute Act, which has the provisions of lockout where you pay only 50% of the wages. So in my view, the payment of wages has to be made. So in a nutshell, this is what the law is in relation to force measure. This is what the law is in relation to frustration of contract. I, I have given you a bird's eye view of what is meant by uh, frustration of contract and what is meant by force major, uh, by, by force major. I will be very happy to, because most of the people would be interested in a question and session, and I will be very willing to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was uh, very concise and uh, clear. We understood that force major has to be bilateral, not unilateral, that the threshold is very high and it cannot be easily applied. And, um, you know, we'll love to hear questions from the audience and please put in your questions if you all haven't already asked them in the chat box and we will go through it and ask. Next, we have Shoujo Mondol, uh, partner of Fox and Mondol, a very uh, well known uh, solicitor. Uh, he will talk about the supply chain, HR and construction issues. Mr. Mondol, uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, uh, Rudro. Uh, firstly, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Sid for organizing this important event and for inviting me to speak. Uh, one of the topics uh, given to me is uh, supply chain management in construction contracts uh, and force major clause. And uh, I think, uh, as Rudro earlier mentioned, that uh, uh, supply chain is a big issue for all kinds of industry especially in the construction sector. And uh, because most of the construction material as well as interior products are uh, imported from China. And uh, although we are having the lockdown from March, but the uh, China started uh, feeling the impact of COVID from early January. And I think uh, since the beginning of the year, a lot of people have been uh, having supply problems uh, from China. Uh, the also the issue of supply of labor due to the migration of workers will also be a big issue for the construction sector. Now, all these uh, issues will translate into increased costs and delay of uh, fulfillment of their contracts. Now, let us just see what we can do in spec respect of construction contracts. A construction contract usually is between, let us say, a builder or a business owner and a contractor. And there would normally be a force majeure clause which would deal with issues such as this. However, in order to take advantage of the force majeure, the contractor would have to comply with the provisions of that particular force major clause and take action or claiming force major as may be provided therein. The contractor must also be able to show that it took all the reasonable steps to mitigate the delay. Increase in cost may not be a defense in this case. And as Mr. Khaitan mentioned, uh, increase in cost cannot uh, be a ground for frustration of a contract. Now let us see the issue from the point of a promoter or a real estate developer. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the HERA is the law which is applicable in West Bengal. And HERA recognizes the concept of force measure in respect of the registration that is granted for a real estate project. Under HERA, the expression force measure is uh, defined to include war, flood, drought, etc or any other calamity caused by nature affecting the rural de uh, regular development of the real estate sector or other circumstance as may be prescribed by the government so but the problem with this clause is that the time to uh, the, the authority only has uh, can extend the period of registration for a period of one year so therefore, uh, it, this uh, hopefully the effect of COVID will not be uh, for more than one year. The other issue is what happens to the delay in delivery of units to a buyer. Most contracts for sale will have 
a force majeure clause or a clause which will excuse the developer in case of force majeure situations. These sort of clauses are not barred under HERA. And therefore, if there is such a clause in the contract, the developer can claim extension of time based on the clause, provided that all the provisions of the clause have been fulfilled. Now, let us see that if there is an increase in the cost, is there a provision that a promoter can ask that the price of the flat or property will be increased because of the uh, increase in cost due to various reasons of COVID. Unfortunately, there is no provision in HERA which allows a developer to increase the cost. And therefore, in my view, it will be difficult for any developer to claim a higher cost than what is provided in the agreement. Of course, I will be happy to take more questions on this issue. Uh, the other aspect of which I have been asked to deal with is HR and inventory management. Inventory management is the one area which will take a huge hit post the COVID crisis. Recently, it has been a trend to operate with minimum inventory and the just-in-time inventory strategy has been the mantra of modern manufacturing. But the COVID crisis has exposed the weakness of this strategy. How do you take care of a situation like COVID? With regard to the effect of COVID-19 on inventory contracts, unless there is a force major clause in the contract, it will not be possible for manufacturers to claim COVID crisis as a reason for delayed performance. With regard to HR management, as Mr. Khaitan uh, mentioned, the payment of salaries to employees and the liberty to retrench and lay off employees will have to wait uh, pending further uh, clarifications from the government of India. Uh, as you heard, the Supreme Court has passed an order today uh, requiring the central government to set forward uh, its policy on this issue within 14 days. Uh, but uh, I think uh, this will uh, take a lot more time for the Supreme Court to decide on whether these kind of restrictions that have been imposed on businesses are valid under the Disaster Management Act. The other issue in HR is that the cost of worker safety will increase significantly after lockdown. There will also be an increase in overall labor costs. Some states have passed notifications that COVID infected employees are to be given 28 days of additional paid sick leaves. Further benefits in favor of employees are also likely in the months ahead. And there's one more issue I'd just like to touch upon is the guidelines that the government of India has issued under the Disaster Management Act for companies that have been allowed to work. All the, the government has made various provisions such as that workplace will have temperature screening and sanitizers and sanitization of workplaces and frequent cleaning of common surfaces in manufacturing facilities. Now, these guidelines issued under the DMA have the force of law under DMA and are punishable by imprisonment. As the lockdown restrictions are slowly lifted and we start going back to work, it is likely that the state and central government will specify measures to be taken by all companies and offices that want to start work. It is important for us to understand that these directions, guidelines issued under DMA since the consequence of non-compliance could be severe. It is interesting that the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs has clarified that there is no provision for legal action against the CEO or sealing of factories offices for violation of these guidelines. However, 
I think that uh, there is ample scope for prosecution of uh, uh, company officials for violation of the DMA and uh, the guidelines issued there under. And therefore, I would suggest that uh, all corporates should comply with the DMA uh, in entire letter and spirit of the act. Uh, this is all uh, I have to say at the moment. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mundol. That was uh, those are the most important issues that we have come across. You know, the ones that you dealt with, whether it was with supply chain or wages, what happens to contracts for construction, um, and there are already a lot of questions on the subject. Uh, on the chat group, some of them I think we'll have time to answer, and some of them might be, if it's okay, you know, Fiki will send to you, and you can, you know, decide whether you'd like to, you know, give feedback on those. Yes, um, we'll answer them. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, next speaker is Mr. Shidhato Dattu. Mr. Shidhato Dattu will talk about the long-term and short-term contracts and cross-border contracts and force-major clauses in COVID-19 situation. Mr. Dattu, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ruzu. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Fiki uh, for organizing uh, this, uh, uh, this webinar at such a, such a crucial time when everybody uh, needs to look at this clause in the contract, which normally is a very much of a boilerplate clause. Nobody really bothers about it. Uh, it's just put into the contract in the last minute. Uh, and now it seems to have become very, very relevant. Um, it, it still has the, the normal clauses still talks about fire, uh, floods, uh, war, but, but, but now those, those clauses will undergo a lot of change uh, after this crisis. So that is one thing which we are definitely going to see that there would be perhaps other uh, uh, developments on the clause and the clause will go through some kind of of, of review. Now, uh, I want to first deal with the with the aspect of cross border contracts, and then I will deal with uh, long term contracts. Now, when there is a cross border contract, typically most uh, export contracts would always be cross border contracts. So, when there would be a cross border contract, there would always be more than two laws involved, and there would be two two more than uh, one country involved in that situation. That would mean that there would be a, a requirement in the contract to have a governing law of the contract, which is going to be the law which is selected by the parties and provided in the contract in order to interpret the terms of the contract. Now, a force measure clause would also be interpreted on that basis. But here is where the complexity lies. Supposing there is a contract between an Indian company and a Brazilian company and it is governed by English law. Now the supply is to take place, let's say from India to Brazil, and either of the parties want to invoke the force major clause. The situation is in these two countries, but the validity of the invocation of the force major clause will be actually determined by the governing law of the contract. Now, this would lead to a lot of complexities in my, in my view, because the governing law of the contract normally also has nuances as to how to test the, the validity of invocation of such uh, a force measure clause. Now, as mentioned by, by Mr. Khatan, uh, force, force measure is not statutory law in India. Uh, it has to be specifically provided in the contract. Uh, this is also the situation in most common law countries, such as the UK, Singapore, uh, in India, of course, Hong Kong, who follow common law principles. The force measure is not part of the statute. So it has to be, in order to apply it, it has to be part of the contract and a specific clause in the contract. It will never be implied in a common law country that or a governing law, which is common law, that there is a force measure clause. Doctrine of frustration is a different doctrine, which of course can be relied upon, but the test for frustration is much more severe. 
which allows sometimes for termination of the contract. But as far as force measure is concerned, it is different because it, 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 it specifies suspension of the contract for a certain period of time. There is a distinction which I would like to bring to everybody's notice about civil law countries, such as China, France, Russia, Italy, Germany, and, and, and uh, United Arab Emirates, they have specific statutory provisions on force measure. So if your contract is governed by any of these laws, but it does not provide for a force measure clause, it doesn't mean that there is no force measure clause. The, the, the law of that country, which is the governing law, would provide for force measure provisions in the code itself. So just to answer Rudra's question, that sometimes you will have contracts where there is no force measure clause. The impact of that would definitely depend a lot on which is the governing law of, the, of that particular uh, contract. Now, as far as uh, uh, other cross-border issues are concerned, we must know that there are lots of global contracts where there is performance in more than one country under one contract. Now, because this pandemic has got different levels of impact in different countries, the invocation of the clause has to be more country specific. You need to know whether performance in that particular country is, is, is uh, hindered and, and it's only on that basis that you can actually uh, 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 invoke a force majeure clause. Now, um, uh, having said that, I would now like, like to come to the next topic for the next uh, three minutes um, on long-term and short-term contracts. Now, the reason for this is that one of the most important impacts that we are going to have is what will happen after the force majeure event or the period gets over. There would be economic hardship which will be faced by a lot of companies. Now, in that situation, can you say that the force majeure clause continues and can you get benefit of the force majeure clause? A lot of that depends on the clause itself. Sometimes the clause provides for certain consequences. But uh, economic hardship, unprofitability, not commercially viable, these are not grounds to avoid performance of a contract. And therefore, we must be very, very careful as to what exactly the contract requires you to do. Because after the force measure period gets over, let's say that it's accepted by both of the parties. Sometimes it is severely disputed. Now, if it is accepted by both the parties, post, post force measure, which would mean post lockdown period, there would be perhaps certain kind of difficulties faced in order to get back to the pre uh, force measure uh, levels of supply or levels of production, uh, stopping production and restarting costs money. Uh, and so therefore, there might be some difficulties. Now, interesting questions would then arise that whether, uh, the, uh, whether you can still say that the force measure uh, continues. Now, in short-term contracts, it's normally easier to invoke force measure than in long-term contracts. The reason being that in long-term contracts, the force majeure is normally a, a, just a period of, of, of the contract. It, it, it's not the whole period. So let's say that you have a 24-month contract. Now, how you use your force measure of provision in that situation is extremely important because the obligations which are there in the contract, depending on the terms of the contract, you might have to fulfill those obligations again. And just to conclude, let me just put it this way. It's called the primary test obligation. Supposing you have a contract to supply of supply with a company for 12,000 metric tons of iron ore to be supplied as 1,000 metric tons per month. And there is a force measure uh, uh, provision which is invoked. It's accepted by the parties. And so for three months, the supply is actually uh, suspended. Now the question will arise that in the fourth month, when you're going to resume supply, are you supposed to make up for those three months? Are you supposed to make sure that those three months supply is actually supplied or will those three months supply be treated as canceled? Normally, if the contract is for an entire contract volume, then the, the, the parties can insist 
that the entire contract be performed after the force majeure period. And by before the end of the period, the entire quantity is adjusted and, and, and supplied. So in a short term contract, the, it, might, it might be totally different because parties would not have contemplated such a major change in situation. It may be more acceptable to the parties to, to, to come out of the contract on both sides, but then long term contracts are, are difficult. The last point I want to make here is long-term contracts also provide different mechanisms. For example, there are take or pay clauses, there are minimum of take clauses, there is rights to reduce the supply or, 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 or downgrade the, the quantities. Now, now, those rights are also equally important in a force majeure situation. It's not only the force majeure clause. There are other rights of variation, novation, which also have to be looked at simultaneously for price adjustment. So um, I think that's about it for, for, for me. And then we will take a lot of questions after this. Thank you. Thank you, Rudol. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, the speakers, all three of you, uh, you know, touched upon very, very critical issues. We've been flooded with questions. Uh, one thing, let me clarify, although I'm, uh, not a solicitor myself, that there's some questions that you'll have to go to the solicitors and pay the fees to all get answered. Yes. You will get the, some of these questions that you are going to ask in general are questions that we can, um, you know, ask the solicitors because these are general questions. But, you know, if you, um, if your question is very detailed, uh, I, I think that those are questions we cannot, you know, have them answered in this webinar. But let me start by a question which I think is very interesting and timely by Mr. Ramesh Sharma. Uh, you know, and you know, I think it could be answered uh, by Mr. Khaitan if he is uh, willing. Uh, the question is on restrictions imposed on FDI on neighboring countries. Um, if there is a product that is can only be imported from one of those countries, uh, can force major be applied? This is a question from Ramesh Sharma. You see, if you saw my, I gave, I gave a press interview on this subject uh, on FDI. Now, under the WTO rules, uh, you cannot uh, prohibit an import or export unless for security reasons. So what the, they have done basically now that uh, they have, I, I'm sure he meets China. What they have basically done that there is no prohibition on import. Uh, there is a, the only thing is that uh, if under the automatic group, uh, now most of the goods are under the automatic group, and if under the automatic group, uh, if somebody is to be imported in these three countries, then you require prior approval of the government. That's all. So therefore, there is no bar. Uh, may, maybe it will take some time. But let me tell you that after COVID-19, uh, most of the Europe, uh, countries in the European Union has, import, has imposed restrictions, you know, on... Uh, uh, investment. But as far as the imports are concerned, as far as the imports are concerned, there is no restriction. I mean, today, uh, in, on restrictions on investments is there, but on the import, there is no restriction. And let's say it's on a prohibited list. So in, if in that particular country, if in that particular country, they do, you, you have placed an order and they, he's not in a position to supply, actually he can invoke a force major clause because it is a supply within a particular period of time. As you said, either it's a short-term contract or it's a long-term contract. If it's a short-term contract, if the importer is suffering from the COVID issue, he can take a point that, you know, I'm covered by COVID-19, I'm covered by COVID-19. But if it is a long-term contract, then of course he has to supply the material after the, after the, if the COVID-19, you know, the lockdown period is over under the COVID-19. Uh, if, if there is a supply from a particular country and there is no other country uh, who will supply that material, now, uh, it's a question of whether that supplier is in a position to supply it or not. If it's in a position to supply, we'll of course supply the material. I mean, there is no difficulty on that. But if it's a position not to supply, the force measure provisions will apply. So therefore, I have really not understood the question part of it, you know, that what he really means by force measure. And if there is a restriction on supply of goods from one particular country. Because if, if like, uh, like medicines, you know, they require raw material from China today. Today, China is supplying the raw material because it's in a position to supply. But suppose it was not in a position to supply, then they could have invoked the force measure clause and they would not have supplied it. That's our and, 
sir, the question is a follow-up question. If what if there's an FDI yes. from one of the neighboring countries, yes. which gets restricted? Yes, there is no, there is no, uh, there is. Uh, let me put it this way: today, after COVID-19, uh, in fact, Italy has passed a law where all FDI has been restricted. It requires government approval. Now, as far as uh, India is concerned, the restriction is only in relation to three countries or the automatic group. And that too, the restriction is only to a limited extent that it requires approval of the government. That's the only restriction that it requires. And it can be for various reasons. It can be for security reasons. Though they have said that it is in relation to hostility. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Mundol, there's uh, several questions. I'll uh, pick the question from Rashmi. Uh, can a principal contractor rely on force majeure clause to suspend hiring of equipment or manpower during the lockdown from a contractor? In terms of equipment, uh, the, I'm sure the provisions will depend on what the contract uh, between uh, the contractor and the principal uh, is. So therefore, if there is a force major uh, clause which allows um, the principal to stop uh, hiring equipment, uh, definitely uh, it can be uh, done as per the provisions of the force major. Because I, I, in my view, most of the force major clauses uh, would cover a situation like COVID, but uh, of course it will depend on that specific clause. On the yeah. issue uh, hiring people. Uh, on the issue of hiring people, I am sure if the contract allows uh, the principal to uh, reduce the labor intake during a certain period, then it will be possible. But otherwise, uh, it is very unlikely that uh, if there is a force major clause in such a contract. But uh, if there is a force major clause, there is no problem to use that even in case of employees. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Uh, for Mr. Dotto, there's a question. Force major contracts. I think you touched upon this, but you know, there's a few questions on the subject, so I'll just ask this question. Uh, application of force major contracts in a contract where timing is not of the essence. Um, the how does it apply? Well, uh, it, it would depend. I mean, timing. Most contracts would provide for a time by which the contract has to be completed. Um, uh, so, so time may not be of the essence, but then the contract term would still provide for a time for completion of the contract for thirty days, or sixty days, etc. So, so it is the postponement of the performance that we are uh, talking about. Now, now one thing we must remember that force major clause suspension never extends the period of the contract. So that has to be done by mutual negotiation. And uh, then only can a period of the contract be extended. It never implies, invocation never implies that the period of the contract is automatically extended. So I hope, uh, I hope I've been able to give some detail on this. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, can I ask the host from Fiki to make sure that other than the panelists, everybody is muted? Because the, not only the... the uh, talk, but also the videos moving away from the panelists. Thank you very much, Mr. Doctor. Uh, I'll ask some questions which are um, uh, have been asked from before, and I would call on first, if they're there, they can ask the questions themselves, otherwise I'll ask the questions. Mr. Kumar Potodia, Director of Heritage Realty Group. Um, Mr. Potodia, are you here? Hi, Mr. How are you? How are you? Doing well. Please ask your question, Kumar. Yeah, thank you all, uh, the panelists, for a very interesting session. Uh, I have two uh, short questions. Uh, one is that, you know, one of the conditions for applicability of force major clauses in contracts is whether an event or condition is foreseeable or not. That is, whether it can be anticipated. So given the current awareness and global nature of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, do you think that claims for force major events just satisfy the test of unforeseeability because you know uh, many of us knew 
for a few months that it was probably going to come to India. So, uh, question one. And the next question is, you know, there are several changes in laws taking place as governments continue to implement new legislation and directives in response to the spread of COVID-19. In this context, will these governmental recommendations and guidance constitute a change in law under existing contracts and will it have any implications? Thank you. Um, Mr. Potoria, uh, you've asked the question. Can you uh, say who you want to ask this question from? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, maybe uh, Siddharth can take it up. Right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, now, now uh, the two things here. Uh, one is that the regulations which come, uh, whether uh, that would be change in law. I must say that's a very interesting question. Um, now, change, uh, it will not perhaps be a change in law in that uh, sense, uh, because uh, no uh, uh, law uh, which, 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 uh, which is coming is new. Uh, if you see, there's a lot of significance because the regulations and the directions have been given under the NDMA. NDMA existed. So therefore, there has been no change in law in that sense. It's, it's existing law, which has been used by the government to, to make the, the uh, uh, give the uh, directions. Um, however, uh, I would like to say one thing that certain contracts provide for a two different types of clauses. It's called material adverse effect clause and material adverse change clause. Now, these two clauses are a little lower in hierarchy than the force majeure clause. But if your material adverse change clause includes a, a change of regulation or a change uh, which, which, which hampers your business uh, by way of a governmental intervention, uh, then that would definitely amount to a, a change and you can take advantage of that. So now, there's some debate. And I cannot have that debate right now, but I must mention to you that some force measure clauses provide for governmental intervention. Now, so some people are interpreting the lockdown circular as a governmental intervention uh, within the meaning of the force measure clause. So, so that's, that's very interesting. And, and, and I guess I, I could um, uh, discuss this with you sometime offline in more detail. Thank you very much, Mr. Dutta. Uh, is Mr. Namit Shah uh, on? He has a question. Mr. Namit Shah, Honorary Consul of Netherlands. Hi, Radra. Good evening to you. Thank Good you. How are you? Uh, my question actually is a little bit different, and I want to ask as to how do we prevent the possible misuse of force majeure by corporates who would want to wrangle out of their corporate responsibilities or contractual responsibilities might want to cancel contracts or renegotiate contracts. And this has, uh, I would say, far-reaching effects when we are dealing with the MSME sector, which in any case is very badly hit. So it could be the death blow for many MSMEs if large corporates use force majeure and strong arm MSMEs. And what safeguards can there be for the sector? And that's my question. Mr. Shah, can you uh, tell us who do you want to ask this question to? Uh, could sure you, sure you go ahead and take this. Oh, Mr. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is more of a commercial issue than a legal one because you see, force measure is will be governed by the terms of the contract and what whether it's a large corporate or a small the fact is uh, anyone can use this clause as far as what is provided in the contract you cannot go beyond what is there in the contract a force major only delays performance of a contract uh, for the period during which the force major event with regard to payment, there is no provision to withhold payment on the basis of force majeure. 
force major only defers the performance contract for a certain period. So, of course, there, there could be issues, as you have mentioned, that there would be issues where larger corporates may use it. Uh, but other than strictly following the contract and taking uh, legal action as per the terms of the contract, um, I don't really think there's much you can do legally. Thank you, Mr. Mundul. Uh, can Mr. Jagdish Gulati ask the next question? He's uh, from the Indian Leather Exports Association. Uh, hi, hi everybody. Thank you, uh, Rudra. Actually, my question is, uh, I represent, I'm a president for Indian Leather Products Association. Under me, more than uh, uh, 160 exporters are there for the leather product. At this situation, our industry is in a very bad shape because all, all over Europe, America, all business is almost closed down. So now issue is coming for the wages and salaries. So all the people are saying, how we go about uh, what our association can help. So they were asking about that we make a frame line from the association to pay salary or wages in part or half part. They want us to take decision. That's the reason I just want to ask, is it association can take decision for the salary and wages to the exporter who, who has a factory like? Uh, Mr. Gulati, who are you asking the question to? Can you just specify? Yeah, uh, you can, Mr. Khetan can reply, Mr. Khetan, NJ Khetan. Hello. Before I, before I answer this question, uh, I would like to deal with the earlier issue, which is a very, very important question, because this also relates to uh, MSME. And I think the leather also comes under the MSME. Yeah, yeah, sector that's also. correct. Yeah. Now, uh, <clears throat> the issue today is that how do you protect MSME sector? Mm. So, as far as the force measure clause is concerned, let me be clear that uh, if it is in the large, if the pregnancy sector has to uh, uh, comply with the contracts, they cannot say that because I am a MSCB sector, so therefore, you know, I should be given a special treatment, whether it's a payment of rent or it's a payment of wages. But let me start with one thing that what is evolving around the, all over the world. Now, all over the world, this this question is arising that how do you protect the MSME sector? And let me tell you what, is, what the other part of the world are doing. Now, let me take the case of Germany. Now, the Germany has taken a, a issue, there is a principle called stop the clock. And what happened when you, they say that this principle of stop the clock, that the day the lockdown is declared, the clock is stopped. So that means everything is stopped at that particular day. And what they have done, what Germany has done, say, very interesting thing that they have given a right to consumer and small businesses, right to consumer and small businesses to refuse performance of contract. That means that a special provision has been made where they can refuse the performance of contract. Similarly, as far as the payment of rent is concerned, you know, because as I said that there cannot be any waiver of rent as far as the force measure, there is no, there is no suspension of payment, you know, there can be a suspension of performance. So what they have done, that they have given an extension for payment of rent for a period of 24 months in, in, in Germany. And they, they have also come, uh, they have also have a specific provision that they have passed a law saying that there will be no termination of rent, uh, termination of lease if there is, if the rent, payments of rents are not paid. Similarly, uh, they have also come up with a very innov innovative issue that the Singapore has come up with a very innovative law which is known as the Singapore Temporary Measure Act 20. Now there they have said that if a, if a claim for demand is made on you, then they have given you a period to reply to that demand within a period of six months. That means they, uh, today if a demand is raised on you, you have, given, you have been given a time to reply to your demand and uh, or to say, state your defense within a period of six months. Now they have, and they have, what they have also done that enforcement of all security interests, enforcement of all security interests has been suspended for a period of 24 months. In fact, I was having a webinar with uh, Justice uh, Honorable Minister and Mr. Nitin Gadkari uh, just two days back. And I, uh, everybody in the, from the industry was asking for fiscal package. But I, I told Mr. Gadkari that I am not asking for a fiscal package. 
what i want that you want to protect the industry you want to give the relief to the industry just do one thing suspend the enforcements of security for a period of 6 months or one year i'll give you a very small example and just a minute this is very important that recently what has happened that a new law is evolving you know the courts are taking a they into consideration the new law now what has happened a person has given his uh, security his spread his best is share to the financial institution and you know because of the covid 19 the price of the shares fell down so therefore the financial institutions called upon the uh, pledger that you know you make good the difference in the price otherwise you will sell your share the pledger went to the court and got an order of injunction saying that because of the covid 19 my share prices has gone down this is a very extraordinary circumstances and the court granted an injunction now this court this point of an order was totally unprecedented so what i am trying to say that you know this covid 19 the court would take a very liberal view a new jurisprudence will evolve on the fairness and equity so therefore i i personally feel as i said that today you said you have a small scale industry and if you don't pay the rent today you know If, even if this law is not passed, if you don't pay the rent, the landlord landlord cannot evict you within a day. It's a long drawn process for eviction. So therefore, I'm sure that in time to come, some kind of a arrangement will be arrived there. You know, and as far as the wages are concerned, uh, if, uh, I know it's a directive and uh, it's a direction, it's a law which has been passed. But if you have no funds, how do you pay? I'm sure the unions and everybody would sit with you and kind and come uh, come to some kind of an understanding. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Doctor. Do you want to add to that uh, comment? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rudra. I would just like to add two things. Uh, the first thing is on misuse. It's very, very important to know that for a valid invocation of a force majeure clause, it should be very clear that it is only the force majeure event which actually prevented the performance if you can show that this party did not anyways want to perform or that it was in default before the force majeure period then of course you have a much stronger case you are not helpless with a force majeure situation second china is uh, for in, it's china now it will be other uh, uh, countries they are issuing force majeure certificates i am sure that many chambers here also would be issuing force majeure certificates once it is designated by the by the by um, by uh, the government now a force majeure certificate is only evidence of an event it is not that that you you will not be able to still say that there's misuse because um, now there might be other circumstances which shows that the force majeure is only ancillary to the real default number 1 number 2 is that the clause itself should allow for a force majeure in that situation so just because you may be faced with a certificate from any country doesn't mean that your contractual rights go away that's that's all on the misuse point Th thank you rudra for that thank you mr khaitan and uh, thank um, thank you for the question um the next two questions from mr alok kumar and from uh, mr sanjeev gupta mr alok kumar can you go first uh hello good evening everybody in fact my question is that if we are issuing the force majeure notice and uh, before the force majeure event is uh, ended the contract got expired then in what uh, that case whether the contract term will be automatically extended or uh, it will be like the fate of the parties okay can we take another question and then you know both questions can be answered one after the other mr sanjeev gupta okay let's answer mr alok uh, kumar's uh, question who would you like this question to be uh, answered by uh, mr mondal mr mondal mr mondal can you answer mr alok kumar's question yes so if i understood you correctly uh, you were saying that before the force major notice is given the contract expires no correct. the contract uh, the notice has been given but the cessation notice has not been given and the contract expires in between yes 
well uh, if the say, if the force major event is still continuing normally yeah. in my view it uh, the contract uh, will get extended however it will depend on the language of the contract itself and uh, what the force major clause says because uh, it will depend definitely on the wording of the force major clause itself so it will be a very subjective answer and uh, i think we will have to look at the specific clause before giving you any advice on this yeah okay, okay. thank you so we can we'll take a couple more uh, questions uh, because it's already 6 o'clock uh, next question miss anupama surekha director of hartex rubber uh, can you ask the question is miss anupama surekha available to ask a question is mr rajesh kumar available to ask a question we unmuted her miss anupama surekha if she is not unmuted mushu me please make sure that she is unmuted and otherwise mr rajesh kumar can also ask a question so while we are waiting we'll ask um, a question from mr rk chajar managing director of vikrant forge if uh, force major applicability of contracts are also are they applicable for contracts between corporate borrowers and lenders or just is it applicable between banks and corporate borrowers or nbfcs or it's ap applicable across the um, board this is a question from mr rk chajar um may i ask this question to mr dotto yes so i'll just take uh, the question uh, by 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 parts so, yes uh, if i may um so so as far as the first part of the question is concerned uh, between corporate uh, borrowers and and uh, and uh, lenders uh, now Uh, what's important is that it would depend upon the uh, the terms of the of the agreement now uh, if the if because force majeure is very much uh, very very uh, specific to the contract if mo normally loan agreements will not have a force majeure clause in the sense which will cover this kind of a situation so so uh, it will be very very difficult to say that force majeure uh, uh, can be invoked when no force majeure is there secondly most loan agreements are are for a longer period and as i talked about long term contracts there may be long term financial contracts like a long term loan agreement you can't walk out of a loan agreement on a force majeure on 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 for covid 19 it's it's not possible so so a lot of uh the uh, financial instruments it will depend on the terms um and it would it would require negotiation with the respective banks and financial institutions and of course i mean um rbi is is stepping in uh in a way um uh, but but uh, it's strictly contractual there cannot be a general law application to that situation thank you is miss anupama surekha available to ask a question so if not i think it's uh, past 6 o'clock and i won't uh, you know keep you any longer you know we started a couple of minutes late but this was a riveting discussion there's lots of questions which are not answered what we will do is fiki will send all the three speakers these questions please yes. see which ones if you wish to answer and we will send it back to the people who have asked the question uh, but i think broadly we uh answered a lot of questions this was a great session thank you very much for uh, coming for it and thank you moshumi for organizing it thank you rudra and on behalf of on behalf of kitty i'll uh, thank the speakers and the audience for asking these great questions and uh, rudra a lot of the questions are that whether they can see the you know the video of this this will be posted on the fiki website so the entire recording they can go through it and see the legal questions they have asked some of which has been answered 
thank you all and thank you for the speakers very much too you know i'm sorry for the delay because there are a lot of multiple webinars which vicky is doing so it, it got a staggered thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank you to vicky once again thank you rudra thank you Bhikki.